Okay, this one's by request. Uh, it's a physical science video. So I think I might make some more physical science videos, but uh, it's something that comes up a lot. And that's, imagine that the Earth did not have an atmosphere. Uh, what would the temperature of the surface be? It's it's not a terribly difficult com calculation, uh, but there, and I'm not going to do the actual calculation. I want to build up all the ideas to that. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in this situation. Uh, it has to do with the sun. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but it's the sun. It has to do with the earth, not to scale. It's got some continents in here, not to so scale. Uh, and it has to do with light. Okay, so let's start talking about light. Uh, you know, we, we say light, but it's really an electromagnetic wave. So it's an electro, because it has an oscillating electric field, and magnetic, mag because it has a magnetic field. So like all waves, there are three properties of a wave that are important. First of all, this is a depiction of an electromagnetic wave. I'm showing the oscillating electric fields. There's also a magnetic field that's perpendicular to that, but I didn't draw it because it's, it's kind of difficult to draw. I really just want to draw a wave. And the three things that you really need to know about an electromagnetic wave is the wavelength. So the wavelength is the, if you froze this in time, if you were able to just take a snapshot, which you can't do, um, and you measure the distance from one peak to the next peak, that is what we call the wavelength. And so we represent that with the symbol lambda, the Greek letter lambda, and that's the wavelength. It's important, um, link, uh, for a couple of reasons. You know, how do we describe the difference between different electromagnetic waves? I'll talk about that in a second. One way is the, is the wavelength. The next thing that we could do is to measure, if now unfreezes, and look at how fast this peak moves. The peak travels along this way. And we call that uh, the wave speed. For all electromagnetic waves, this is uh, constant, C. So C is, and this is measured, wavelengths measured in meters. C is the speed. And for light, electromagnetic waves, radio waves, x-rays, everything, as long as it's in a vacuum, that speed is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. We call that really fast. It's a really important constant. That's why it comes up a lot. And then finally, imagine that um, I just stood right here and looked at this point and I said, how many peaks pass per second? I would call that the frequency. And so there's two ways you can write this. Some put F for frequency, and some use the Greek letter nu. It looks like a V, but it's not. And that's the frequency. And that's in, in one over seconds, uh, which we also call a hertz. Okay. Uh, and then these three quantities are related. C equals lambda times the frequency. That's true for all uh, electromagnetic waves. Okay, so that's your, your light primer. Now, if you, it turns out that, I'm going to talk about the wavelength, but clearly if I change the wavelength, I have to change the frequency, right? So if I increase the wavelength, the frequency decreases. But let's just talk about the wavelength. If I have very long waves, electromagnetic waves, they interact differently with matter than short electromagnetic waves. So the wavelength tells you how that wave interacts with matter. And we call them different things, right? So if I have... Uh, a wavelength from, let's say, 1 to 100 meters or even bigger, then we call that a radio wave. And there's a, there's a large range for that. So let's just say huge, huge. And then if, let's say you have a radio, wa uh, a electromagnetic wave with a wavelength of about, this is lambda. Let's say lambda is about a centimeter. Then that would be a microwave. And again, there's a range. And then if you get a wavelength around, um, let's say, 10 micrometers, so that's 10 to the negative 6 meters, that's infrared. And then if the wavelength is around 1 micrometer, then that would be visible light. So there's a very, very tiny range of wavelengths that, that our eyes can detect, and we call that visible light. But all the other stuff is still there. We just, we just don't detect it with our eyes. Uh, and then shorter wavelengths, I'm not even going to write down the things. This goes, and it goes to ultraviolet, that's UV. And then even shorter than that, it would be um, X-rays. 
and then even shorter than that, it's gamma rays. Okay, so we have this electromagnetic spectrum. They're all electromagnetic waves, they just have different wavelength. They all travel at the same speed. Okay. The next thing that we need to talk about is energy. Uh, so imagine that I have a table and it's one meter tall. And then I take a textbook like that. And this textbook has a mass of, um, let's say it's a mass is approximately uh, one kilogram. So you know, like, that's, a, that's about a textbook. If you take a textbook, it's about a kilogram. Now I lift it up here and I put it on the table over here. Then that's gonna take some energy. You have to exert some energy in order to do that. And so in this case, energy is a way to describe interactions, but in this case, the energy would be about 10 joules. And I like to do that because it's a way to kind of quantify what a joule is. A joule is a unit of energy. Um, when we can describe energy in all sorts of ways, things that are moving have energy, uh, things that have mass have energy, that's how nuclear reactors work, uh, things that are hot have energy, we can relate energy to temperature, so we can describe a whole bunch of things with energy, and that's important energy. But the next thing is, suppose that I lift this book up and it takes me uh, an hour, and then I'll lift it up in a second. Clearly there's two different things about that, it's the same change in energy going from here to there, but they take different times. So the next thing we have is power. Power is the rate that energy is done, right? And we use, I like to say delta T, E over delta T, so say change in energy, because we have to go from this energy to that energy over a change in time. If you do energy over time, it doesn't always work. I mean, it, I get it, we all get it, but I wouldn't do energy over time. So in this case, if I took, uh, let's say delta T is one second, then power, I'm going to call this power one, would be the change in energy of 10 joules over one second, and that'd be 10 joules per second, and we call that a watt. So that would be 10 watts. 10 watts, that's about the power of an LED light bulb that you screw in. They're around 10 watts. If you take those older ones, the incandescent ones that get hot, they're more like 60 to 100 watts. Um, but that tells you that's some way you can connect. If you have a coffee pot, uh, when the coffee pot's on, it has to get really hot and has to heat up a whole bunch of water. It's gonna be like a thousand watts. So it's not how much energy you have to put in that coffee that matters, it's how fast. Now let's say that I do uh, delta T equals 10 seconds. I take 10 seconds to move this up. Then in that case, P2 would be 10 over 10 or one watt. So in both of those cases, it's the same change in energy, but it's different power. Okay, so watt is a unit of how fast you do stuff, and it's in a one watt is a joule per second. Now, when we talk about um, the sun, the sun has a power output. It radiates energy outward through the electromagnetic radiation. But if we look at the total power and I want to talk about a planet over here, really the, the quantity I want is something called the intensity. This is the power per area. So imagine this, if I have a radiating uh, sun and I enclose this with a sphere and I capture all that energy, well, all that power coming out, all that power is spread around that sphere evenly. Now if I go here to a bigger sphere at the, at the location of that planet, then it's the same amount of power, but it's spread over a larger area. And so this intensity is a way to quantify the power per unit area due to something like that. So, um, and it, it, it could be any sort of thing, but the important thing is that the sun, as you get further away, the total power is the same, but the intensity decreases. Uh, this really matters, right? If we're talking about uh, how hot a planet is, if you have a planet very close to the sun, then it, the intensity of the sunlight is larger, and further away at Pluto, it's very, very small. At the Earth, uh, the intensity of the sun is around uh, 1,300 watts 
per square meter. All right, so that means if I had a square meter of surface and the light was hitting that, it'd be 1300 watts hitting that. Okay, let's talk about, um, I had this, I was gonna use this as the sun, but I didn't use it. This is my, see it's on. It's not that bright though. I put a little LED in a, in a ping pong ball. That's my son. Um, okay, so let's talk about black body radiation. So this is the idea that uh, an object emits light, like the sun, uh, depending on its temperature. So I'm gonna jump over to this simulation uh, from FET. Uh, it's a really great simulation. I'll put a link to it down below. You should play with this. So let's switch over here. Um, and I just realized I might need to move my, th oh, I think that's okay. Okay, so this is uh, some object that's hot, okay? And, and if you turn on your oven and you look at the element inside, it starts getting hot right away, but eventually gets so hot that it glows. That's the idea behind black body radiation. So let me explain this graph here and then we're gonna play with it. This, uh, it turns out that a black body produces light of different wavelengths, right? It will produce a whole bunch of different wavelengths of light. But there are two things that change as you change the temperature of that object. One is this uh, highest peak intensity wavelength, and the other is the total amount of light produced. So on this graph right here, this is the intensity per wavelength, you can think of it. Okay, It's not the total intensity produced. No, it's not the total watts per square meter produced by this object. Uh, you can do that by adding, essentially finding the area under this curve. This will do that by integrating it for you like that. That's kind of nice. And it gives you the, the value right there. Um, and then it, we have labels. So here you can see this is short wavelength light. It's ultraviolet. Here's your visible spectrum. And in the visible spectrum, we define different colors as different wavelengths. So we go from red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, and that's the rainbow of colors. And then all the other colors you can get by mixing those. So there's no pink in there. That's a mixture of more than one light color. And then this is the lower wavelengths, infrared, and then it would keep on going to, ultraviolet, uh, to radio waves and stuff like that. And so if I combine all these colors together, this is what it would look like. It'd be white. And this is the temperature of the sun. So let's go down to the temperature of a light bulb. You can drag this down. And two things happened. Number one, the total intensity of light decreased. The total area under that curve got smaller. Number two, the peak shifted, right? So now my, my peak intensity is in the infrared. It's over here. And it's hard to see even. So let's zoom in. I'm gonna just click the zoom in button right there. So now I've zoomed in so I can see it. And you see here that most of my light is in the infrared. And, but I do get still visible light right here. And that's why a light bulb, which is not as hot, doesn't appear as white. If, Cause I have more red than I have blue and I add those colors together, it makes it more orangey. If I find the intensity, you can see that it's uh, 4 times 10 to the 6, or 4.9 times 10 to the 6 watts per square meter. And if I go back up to the sun, see it's 6 times 10 to the 7, so, you know, 10 times more. Okay, so it, it does change. Um, so those are the two things that change. This peak intensity, which we don't really care about. We really care about the total amount of power coming off of that, integrating this. But that does change as the temperature changes. Okay, um, graph values, you can do this too. Uh, and then I can move this around. This is, this is a, such a great simulation. They do such a great, uh, great job here. And then you can even decrease this even further. Um, here is a colder object, and this is like your oven element. It's at 250 Kelvin, uh, and it'd just be red because it's, most of the, the radiation is in the infrared, and that's what it's doing to heat up your food, infrared radiation. But it does still produce some bright light. And then if you get like super, super, super hot like this, you can see that we get more in the blue range. Let me just decrease this. So the peak radiation over here is in the ultraviolet, uh, but that means you're gonna get more blues and purples and reds, and overall the whole thing will look blue. So red hot is not right, right? It should be blue hot. That thing's so hot is blue hot. That's what you should say. We should all start saying that. Okay, so that's what we call black body radiation, because you can see an object two ways, 
one, because it creates its own light from its temperature, and two, light could be reflected off of it, right? If I hold up this coffee cup, light is coming over here, reflecting into the camera, and you see it. It's not, you're not seeing it because it produces its own light. It does, but it's light that it produces it is in the infrared, and you can't see it. Our eyes can't see it. Okay. Let's go back to the paper. Okay, what am I talking about? So that's black body. So there is a relationship between the intensity of light uh, and the temperature of an object. And this is called the Stefan Boltzmann Law. So these are two people. If you do something like this, they'll name it after you. Just a motivation, Bolt, Boltzmann. And it looks like this. The intensity is, I'm going to tell you what these things are. Epsilon, sigma, t to the fourth. So this says that the intensity of an object is equal to epsilon, which is we call the emissivity. So the emissivity tells you how much, um, let's say it goes from zero to one. Let me just say it this way. Zero to one, this would be perfect uh, emitter of radiation. It'd be what we call a perfect black body. And so if you look at an object that's black, uh, it's absorbing all the colors of light and reflecting none, and that, that no light makes it look black. That's why when it's you're in a dark room, things look black. Uh, and this would be a reflector over here. So zero. So it'd be like a perfectly shiny piece of aluminum foil or something like that. All the light reflects off of it. Okay, so the amount of, of and the intensity of the light produced by a radiating object depends on that property. So we have to know what that depends on the object. Sigma is called the Stefan Boltzmann constant. I'll call it SB constant. It's just a number. And if you want to know, it has a value of approximately 5.678, no, 670 times 10 to the negative 8 uh, watts per meter squared Kelvin to the fourth. And I haven't talked about temperature. I guess I should say something like that. So when we talk about temperature, which is the next one, we're going to use temperature in units of uh, Kelvins. Kelvin. So if you are familiar with the Celsius temperature scale, then we know that uh, Tc uh, equals zero Celsius. That's the freezing point of water. Tc equals 100 Celsius, that's the boiling point of water. Um, and then you can actually have negative temperatures, but we don't want to have negative temperatures because then we'd have a negative intensity. So if I put in a negative number right here, then I could, well, actually no, because it's to the fourth power. But there are situations where this could give, we don't like negative temperatures. So what we do is we just shift this whole scale so that the coldest possible temperature ever is zero Kelvin. So one, um, so this would be equal to 273 Kelvin, we don't put the degree there, and this would be 373 Kelvin. So just shift that scale. Okay, so that's the temperature. And that's the temperature of the object raised to the fourth power. Okay, where am I at now? Okay, so should I check the units? Let's just show that these units do work. Okay, so there's my intensity. I know intensity is in watts per meter squared. The emissivity is just a ratio. It just tells me a factor between zero and one. It has no units. So I'm just going to put one. It has no units. This Stefan Boltzmann constant, there's its units, watts per meter squared Kelvin to the fourth. And then the temperature is in Kelvins raised to the fourth power. So you see that I have Kelvins to the fourth and Kelvin to the fourth, these cancel. That's a one, so I get watts per meter squared is equal to watts per meter squared. Whenever you have an equation, the units on one side has to equal the units on the other side. Otherwise, bad stuff happens. Not really, but it is a bad idea. So let's say that I have uh, a star. Here's my star. I'm not going to light it up. And then I have a planet. And I want to find out how much light. This is actually a ping pong ball. How much light, how much, the, the power, the rate of energy that this uh, absorbs. And that's important, right? Because this is actually going to do two things. 
This is an energy receiver because it gets energy from the sun, but then when it heats up, it radiates out, oops, and it gets pushed. It radiates out energy. So it does two things. Um, and if, if it receives more power from the sun than it radiates, then it will increase in temperature. If it radiates more than it receives, it will decrease in temperature. And if those two things are equal, then it will be in equilibrium. And so since the Earth is in a circular orbit, we would assume it would have an equilibrium temperature. And we're, this is without any atmosphere. The atmosphere does make a difference. That's the whole idea behind climate change and greenhouse gases. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just talking about what if the Earth did not have an atmosphere. So uh, one of the things that we need to know about the Earth is this thing called the albedo. Al B do. This says how much of that that light coming in is reflected off. You know, if this was like a, a very very dark, rough object, then it would have a very low albedo. Okay, again, the albedo can go from zero to one. And if it's like a super mirror planet, it'd have an albedo of one. So it turns, and we use the the symbol uh, Greek symbol alpha. Looks like that lowercase alpha. Uh, and for the Earth, alpha is about 0.3. So that means that about 30% of the intensity of light hitting it is reflected off. So then the, how much of it, what's the intensity that actually gets to the surface of the Earth? Uh, I, um, we'll call this I, what should I call it? At, let's just say I in, let's say I S for the surface. I know how to use it for the sun. I, Earth's surface is going to be equal to the uh, intensity from the sun. I can move my ping pong balls. Times 70%, right? 70%, if 30%, 0.3, 30 is going to be reflected, then 70% is going to be in. So we write this as uh, 1 minus uh, alpha. Now, yeah, there, there is a connection between these two. Emissivity and, and albedo are related. And I don't know why everyone writes it like this, because you could just use uh, the emissivity. But whatever, it's fine. But now we need to think about the power in, right? So let's take power. So I want to say power in is power out. And I know the intensity at the Earth's surface is the, inten the intensity of the sun times 1 minus alpha. So here's my sun and here's my Earth. And you notice I, I colored in half of the Earth. Because this radiates energy to just this side of the Earth. It doesn't get to that side. So it's not absorbing on this part of the surface area. And so we need to calculate how the light interacts with this area. And, and it is a sphere, but if you take it and you turn it this way, it looks like a circle, right? So circle of radius R, the, R, the radius of the Earth. So if I have this light coming in this way, and then here's my Earth, I only care about this circle of radius r. And the area of a circle is pi, that's r, r squared. So now if I want to calculate my power in, it's just going to be the intensity, Es, at the Earth's surface, times the area of the Earth. And so that's going to be Is times 1 minus alpha times the area, which is pi r squared. Now the Earth also radiates energy, right? So we need to find this p out. Now we can use the Stefan Boltzmann law. So I can say the intensity of the Earth's surface is going to be equal to uh, the emissivity times sigma times t to the fourth. But I want to know the total power. So again, I have to multiply by the area. But in this case, there's two different areas, right? There's the area that it receives energy from the sun, which is a circle. But now when I talk about this, it's radiating energy in all directions. So I need the total surface area of a sphere. So in this case, the area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. That's the surface area. You can look that up. Trust me. Okay. So that means that this power out is going to be 4 pi r squared epsilon sigma t to the fourth. Now I want to set this power out equal to this power in, and I get uh, intensity of the sun, 1 minus alpha, pi r squared, 
equals four pi r squared epsilon sigma t to the fourth. And that's the temperature of the earth. That's what I want to solve for. So first of all, you notice that we get some stuff canceling here. There's a pi on both sides gone. R squared on both sides gone. So now I need, just need to divide both sides by this. I'm going to start a new piece of paper because I feel like I'm crushed. So I get IS 1 minus alpha equals 4 epsilon sigma t to the fourth. So I'm going to divide both sides by this and I get, I'm going to switch the sides to t to the fourth is going to be IS 1 minus alpha over 4 epsilon sigma. Now I need to get rid of this raised to the fourth power and the way to do that is to take it to the inverse to the one fourth power both sides. And so I get T equals uh, I S one minus alpha over four epsilon sigma to the one fourth power. And so some people write that as a fourth root. I mean, I don't really do this because it's kind of silly to write one fourth power. One minus alpha over four epsilon sigma. Okay, so let's talk about, review all these numbers. This is the temperature of the surface of the Earth in Kelvins. This is IS, is the uh, intensity of the sunlight. It's about 1300 watts per square meter. Alpha is the albedo of the Earth, the, the, how, much, how reflective it is, and that's about 0 0.3. Four is equal to four. It's just a number, right, that came from the surface area of a sphere. Uh, epsilon is the emissivity, it's actually 0 0.7, no units, no units on 4 either. And then sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which is 5.67 times 10 to the negative 8, negative 8, uh, watt meter squared per Kelvin to the fourth. If you put in all these numbers up here, then you get a temperature of, what was it, 250? 55. I think it's 255 around there, 255 Kelvin, which is equal to negative 15 Celsius around there. Negative, that's, actually, that's 255. Um, 255 would be negative 6, 5, just 60, 18. But well, the point is it's cold, right? That's pretty cold. But, but the Earth's not that cold because the Earth has an atmosphere. And this is called the bare rock model of the Earth's temperature. So there's a lot of stuff there, um, and I know that took a long time, but because uh, there's a whole bunch, you know, that's the thing with stuff, complicated stuff like the temperature of the Earth. You need to understand energy, power, temperature, uh, electromagnetic waves. It, it's a bunch of stuff. Um, so, but hopefully that helps. If you have any questions, let me know. Post them down below. I'll talk to you later.